Ladies and gentlemen, fellow travelers on the road to a climate resilient future, I'm glad you could make it to this online webinar. Today is an important milestone on our journey to the International Climate Adaptation Summit on the 25th of January 2021. That day, global leaders will launch a comprehensive global adaptation action agenda, setting out concrete new endeavors and partnerships to make our world more resilient to the effects of climate change by 2030. There's no time to waste. Every minute, as I'm speaking to you now, almost one million tons of ice melts in Greenland and Antarctica. The COVID-19 crisis shows how vulnerable we are, how unprepared we are to respond effectively when a pandemic catches us by surprise. But climate change is no surprise. The effects are apparent here and now. Droughts, floods, heavy storms, rising temperatures and a rising sea level. We're in trouble now, so we need to adapt now. Let's share knowledge and expertise on this. Let's join forces around the world to accelerate adaptation action on a much larger scale than ever before. I won't stop repeating this call to action. Our country, the Netherlands, has made a name for itself through centuries of water management and adaptation. So today we're showcasing some examples of Dutch innovations. Nine interactive webinars focusing on Dutch adaptation approach and how we can share this knowledge with the rest of the world. Dealing with water is in our Dutch DNA. Climate change doesn't only compel us to protect our heritage, our heritage can also protect us. Today, the Netherlands National Commission for UNESCO will present local and traditional knowledge that will instill the right level of urgency in our minds. My personal goal is to help scale up global efforts in adapting to the inevitable effects of climate change. I'm happy you're joining me in this venture. I wish you all a constructive and inspiring day. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Marilis Schoas and I'm the Secretary General of the Netherlands Commission for UNESCO. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all here to this live online event on the role of culture in climate adaptation. I would like to start with thanking the Minister for her encouraging words and her Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management for giving us the opportunity to organize this event. Today's session is part of a larger program on the road to the Climate Adaptation Summit in January 2021. As you can see, I'm standing here almost alone. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, our moderator and speakers are not here with us in the studio, but they will join us online from their home offices. So please do bear with me if we um, encounter some technical hiccups, which I hope we won't but you never know in this, uh, in this kind of uh, online events. I couldn't be more happy than to announce to you our moderator, Professor Corinne Hofman. Before giving her the floor, uh, just a few more practical remarks. Uh, this event will be recorded and can be viewed afterwards. This event is also interactive, so you can ask questions and share your thoughts in the public chat function. My colleagues here in the studio will collect questions and remarks so that Professor Hoffman can share them with the panel later on. Now, without further ado, Professor Hoffman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary Lise, and good day to you all for joining us from all over the globe. I'm delighted to host this event today on a subject that is close to my heart. My name is Corinne Hoffman, and I'm Professor of Caribbean Archaeology at the Faculty of Archaeology at Leiden University and Senior Researcher at the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. I'm also a member of the Netherlands Commission for UNESCO. Our commission has advised the Dutch government on UNESCO-related affairs since 1946 and is committed to spreading UNESCO's message of peace, solidarity, and sustainability within our society. 
Today's event is centered on four best practices, highlighting the role that culture and particularly heritage, tangible and intangible, can play in adapting to climate challenges. We will showcase culture-based solutions to local climate adaptation from different parts of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, ranging from Amsterdam to the island of Bonaire. We will start off with the presentations of these four examples, after which we'll, we will continue with a panel discussion. We will illustrate how a different mindset allows us to seek solutions that are human-based, more sustainable and easier to adapt, using local approaches for global challenges. Thus, like UNESCO phrases it, changing minds, not the climate. Please allow me to introduce the projects and speakers of today. Project Waterkanse Kampe, presented by Marike van Zante from Foundation Het Oversticht. Stronghold St. Jan, represented by Huypert Kreins from the municipality of Sertogenbos. Amsterdam Wetlands, represented by Salim Verhoeven from Landschap Noord-Holland. And finally, Cultural Knowledge Systems and Climate Adaptation on Bonaire, represented by Franklin Boy Antoine from Foundation Fuhikubo, Fundacion Historico Cultural Bonaireano. A warm welcome to all of you, and we look forward to your presentations and our discussions afterwards. Let me introduce our first speaker of today, Marike van Sante. Mrs. van Sante is an architectural historian and a heritage consultant as Foundation Het Oversteer, where she focuses on using cultural heritage as a means to tackle the emerging themes and challenges of today. Foundation Het Oversteer is a non-profit organization that works on improving the quality of the living environment for people and with people. Mrs. Van Sante presents the project Waterkanse in the city of Kampen, a project combining heritage, local knowledge from the area, and the use of historical maps to tackle water level challenges in the local neighborhood in Kampen. Mrs. Van Sante, a warm welcome to you, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, you may think, what has our heritage got to do with climate change? And maybe you see heritage consultants as being uh, very aimed at protecting heritage um, and preserving heritage. Or maybe you have, have experienced heritage as being a bit difficult or slowing your process down. Uh, maybe you haven't never thought of it in this, um, in this context at all. But of course, it's very important to uh, preserve our spatial qualities for the future. So whatever it is, I hope I can give you a small insight of our research project, Waterkanse, about using heritage knowledge and how it can benefit climate adaptation measures. So we wanted to try a different approach. We wanted to step away from the preserving attitude and we wanted to develop a new attitude. Uh, we believe that cultural historical knowledge can also contribute to find solutions for current challenges such as climate adaptation. And we think you can find modern solutions in our past. Um, but this requires a completely different approach from experts, both of heritage, also of water management. Uh, but I think that adapting uh, to these new attitudes lies the future of our working area in the future. And not only for climate change, but also for energy and renewable energy and other social uh, challenges. Because if you are not, if you, if you are aware of your water tradition and you use it well, you are preserving and developing your cultural history. Next slide, please. Well, as you may know, the Netherlands is a delta, and um, uh, we have adapted uh, to water for centuries. We have always used water for transport or irrigation. We made new lands, we made small hills to build our houses on, and we fought against the rising water. And our land consists of water systems with items like rivers, canals, dikes, ditches, barks, barge canals and pumping stations and what have you. And all these items and all these um, water systems have developed over many centuries. Um, um, and this is our water heritage, all that development. But due to recent interventions, like more and higher dikes, 
uh, and closure dams and drainage and sluices, um, water is no often longer an acute threat to us. And as a result of that, residents are no longer aware of our water management. But with the climate challenges, our water history becomes suddenly topical again, and the challenges we now face do not stand alone. It's a tradition that we pass on to future generations. It's not a stone monument, it's alive and it's useful. And sometimes the elements of the past, they give you reason or uh, rise to make new additions, so you can use that. And if you use the history of the addition, if you use the history, the addition becomes more logical with a sense of place, and it can help find solutions. And also for design, you can link design with your past. Um, because we think every place has a water history. And we think if you find the story um, uh, and the inspiration for form and, and, and function will follow. So in a nutshell, this was on the slide, our research question, can cultural knowledge contribute to climate change adaptation? Um, we're not scientists. Uh, we were practical, so we wanted to put this research question into a practice at a location with a real problem, a real people, and we found that in the city of Kampen. So I will take you to Kampen. Um, Kampen was always a wet and marshy place by the river Iso. It's an important trade route, and the town started off with a group of merchants in the 13th century, and they built turfs, so little hills, on which they built their houses, and from that on, the city of Kampen developed and it became one of the main medieval trading cities in the Netherlands. And at this moment, it's a really small, beautiful historical town. And the site that we worked on is on the Schans Bolwerk Buitenwacht in Kampen, and it's located on the river dike on the opposite side of the river of the town. And in between the town and the Schans is the Isel Bridge. And the Schans, that's an earthen embankment, and it's part of the medieval defense system of the city. Uh, and it's one of the main entrances now to the city. It's really really a beautiful spot it's a few meters higher than the rest of the of the surroundings and you have a beautiful view of the riverfront of the city so it's a really beautiful place with a lot of potential but it's also a sort of um it's a sort of nothing and everything kind of place it's um it's got a lot of traffic movements trains buses cyclists cars and people on foot it's got a lot of empty grounds a lot of asphalt uh, unattended green spots, uh, parking lots. Um, so the spatial design is very, very unclear and it's not very attractive, but still you sense the beauty and the potential everywhere on that spot. There are um, two water problems. So one is that we have more and heavier downpours and the water comes from the bridge over the embankment down to the slopes and into the streets and the houses below. And the other problem is that the water is not able to go anywhere because uh, the sewer cannot handle this amount of water and the soil is part clay. So the streets and houses are flooding and the basements are permanently filled with water, even these dry years we have had. And um, the municipal has been working on a solution for over eight years but could not succeed on making a plan that had the support of the inhabitants and the entrepreneurs. But they were in communication, so that's good. But that was our our starting point um, and we have prepared a short video for you so you can see the place and you can see all a small introduction of what we have done video please in Kampen, in the province of Overijssel, close to the station lies the bolwerk baltenwacht region for years now the municipality has been working on a plan to restructure this area it does this in collaboration with residents and entrepreneurs but also with the local water authority, the National Cultural Heritage Agency, and het Overstucht. Wij hebben onszelf de opgave gesteld om te kijken van wat is er op deze plek al gebeurd in het water. Hoe zijn mensen op deze plek al met het water omgegaan? To find out where the remains from times past are still present in the ground, soil drillings have been performed and geophysical research has been done. A sort of ultrasound has been made of the area. Results show that in the past, the Bongwerk was an earthen embankment and that there are no longer any foundations present in the ground that the new design can be based on. What the Overstig does is actually in the history of the to see what we can find there and what could be the cause of the water overlast. And we look also at what the reason could be to the measures that we now can find. 
The results of the cultural, historical and hydrology analyses are used to acquire new insights. And thus the realization of a design finally materializes. Eigenlijk komt de kennis hier samen om die kennis vervolgens te uh, ontwerpen, te onderzoeken van wat zou er dan mogelijk zijn in deze locatie. The cultural historical knowledge has contributed to the design and has provided a better picture of the water system, as well as helping to gain the support of the residents. And so a useful contribution has been made in the creation of a renewed part of Compen. Chief, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so we have merged our knowledge with the current water data and with the knowledge of the sewers and the hydrolyst. Um, and uh, it was so much fun to do that because they know every inch of the whole water system. It was really brilliant to do that. And um, because of those conversations and work sessions uh, and exchanging knowledge, we got different views and new insights and new solutions. But there's still a lot to discover. We are really in our early stages of research on uh, uh, water systems. Uh, we, we also heard everything that could go wrong in the process with design or management or knowledge gaps. So working integral is crucial, but it's difficult. Uh, and it became clear to us that should, we should not only combine our content, but also set up a good process for it. Next slide, please. And as researchers, we, uh, we know how to gather information through old city plans, data from researchers that have already been done, uh, landscape knowledge, old photographs, and of course the archives. And if you combine all the data, you have a good idea of how the water system developed over five or six centuries. But the water authorities, uh, they are the oldest governments we have here in the Netherlands, and they did have not have their archives quickly enclosed disclosed, I should say, um, they never thought of the archives as an important source of information about water systems. Some do, of course, but most of the engineers and the hydrologists do not use it very often. But we were surprised about that, but we see their archives as their corporate heritage and the archives itself is heritage and put together is really the fundament of our water heritage. So. We urge the water authorities to make sure that the information is digitally uh, accessible to uh, researchers and make sure that someone knows um, uh, knows and can get the transfers the knowledge to researchers and employees and managers. Um, because it's a gold mine. We think that archives are a gold man mine for it and good for a good process. Next slide, please. So in this process, um, we are trying to connect the dots because every organization has its own responsibilities towards water and water problems. And even, even different teams from the same organizations have different tasks. So it can easily go wrong in stupid little things you're not even aware of. Um, and one thing we have learned in the process is that people tend to start at looking for solutions and already designing them. Uh, and we really urge them not to do that, to stay, uh, start with research and get to know the place and get to know each other um, and what is already agreed on. So talk to the experts involved. So in the process, it's good to integrate a few times and to share results and knowledge and uh, possible causes and solutions. So together with all the experts, inhabitants and governments, it's good to look at the assignment from all points of view at the same time. And we used uh, uh, design research as an instrument because spatial qualities are the key word because in the end, that is what you will see in the streets. Um, the process from our starting point until we had the support of the inhabitants and entrepreneurs in the city council was six months, so it was rather quickly. So in the end, it saves really a lot of time. It prevents mistakes, you get more support and it's faster and cheaper. Next slide, please. And the results are um, uh, that the new approach works. Uh, we know, uh, because we know how the place had developed itself, we understood the place better, and that was the fundament for choosing a good solution. Uh, it contributed to design, and an eight-year process was concluded in six months. And the extra result, the bonus result, and we did really didn't see this coming, is that we got support from the local people and the city council for these measures through heritage. 
Most of the time, it's the other way around. You must find support for preserving heritage. Yeah, I'm very clear. Um, uh, you get support and acceptance for something totally different, the climate change adaptation. So this small shift in perspective is very interesting. You can use cultural cultural history in a, as an instrument if you do it well. And we do, we develop more projects um, and using this perspective, but all, not only on climate change, also on renewable energy. But it's hard to find organizations who are willing to try this because it's a new way. Well, if you've been working in a certain way with certain policies and rules, you and you have done it for a long time, it's very hard to look at your playing field with new eyes. But if your playing field is changing, and, and that is for heritage and water experts, you just have to adjust. You have to look for new possibilities, new solutions, and maybe adjust your minds and attitudes and policies. And we think that heritage can be a useful instrument for modern water management, because our landscape is constantly changing. We always adjust, that's the whole game. And the important thing is when and how we adjust. This can be our future heritage. And it's really the beauty of it. You work in a tradition and you pass it on um, and with doing so, you preserve your heritage. So I hope you can connect water management with heritage, put it on the agendas and bring it into practice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Van Santen for this enlightening presentation. I would now, now like to give the floor to the next speaker, Mr. Hubert Kreins of the Municipality of Thank you very much, Mrs. Van Santen, for this enlightening presentation. I would now like to give the floor to the next speaker, Mr. Hubert Kreins of the Municipality of Den Bosch. Mr. Kreins is an expert and program manager in restoration and urban development at the city of Den Bosch. He presents the case of Bulwark of St. Jan, a fortified heritage structure in the city center that was awarded the prestigious European Heritage Award. The Bulwark of St. Jan is a concrete example of how a tangible heritage structure of the past is used for today's urban water management. It's also an example of how cross-sectoral collaboration and creativity is key to bringing climate adaptation projects to completion. A warm welcome, Mr. Kranz, and may I invite you to start your presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, hello to all participants uh, in the, uh, to this uh, conference. I will uh, first introduce to you the historic town of uh, Sertogenbos and the way the town dealt with uh, threats caused by a change in climate. And then I will briefly present two good practices on heritage-led solutions to climate change. Well, the, town, the town's name Sertogenbos means the Duke's Forest. In 1196, it was granted the city charters by uh, Duke Henry I of Brabant. So Togenbos protected walls allowed trade, arts and crafts to flourish. Until the 19th century, the walled town maintained a reputation of a near invincible stronghold. Next slide, please. The, um, the town earth earned this status due to its iconic Dutch defense works combined with the clever use of water as a means of defense, as a defense mechanism. The town nicknamed itself the Marsh Dragon, as one of the most daunting defenses against siege was the ability to submerge the uh, surrounding marshlands. But as the art of warfare evolved in the 19th century, walls became obsolete. As the city expanded, the defense works were demolished in order to obtain building materials and subsequently transformed to fit new needs. In the winter of 1995, large parts of the Netherlands um, along the rivers Maas, Waal, Isel and Rhine were almost flooded. 
the area around Sotogenbosch submerged once again and rivers surrounded the old wall town. And as the water level kept rising, the citizens were alarmingly reminded that the walls around the town still serve an important purpose. Well, not to protect citizens against the hostile army, but, um, but to protect against flooding. When the water level dropped um, uh, back to normal, the town walls were inspected for their technical condition. The survey showed that the town walls were in a very poor state of repair. Even though restoration was very urgent, funding and public support was lacking for mere restoration. Uh, next slide, please. Instead of a classic conservation plan, the municipality introduced an ambitious development plan for the entire fortified system. Six and a half kilometers of town walls and strongholds surrounding the town. The development plan with the um, unmistakable title reinforced Den Bosch was adopted by the municipal council. And the starting point, point is that military heritage can be of great value when history is not used as a barrier, but rather as a source of inspiration for innovative solutions in which potentially conflicting interests are reconciled. It is an ongoing project since the year 2000 and induced numerous, numerous projects, including the restoration of the Maria Bastion and the execution of St. John's Bulwark. Well, Maria Bastion is uh, one of the heritage-led solutions to climate change that I will share with you today. Um, as in many historic towns, uh, rainwater ends up in the same drainage system as sewage water. And in the event of peak showers, the sewage pipe cannot discharge all the water. During a downpour, the sewage runs in the river, thus polluting the surface water. And next slide, please. Um, a possible solution to prevent this kind of pollution is a sewage basin, a, a temporary storage uh, of uh, sewage and rainwater. And by the time the rain shower is over, the sewage water can be pumped to the treatment plant. However, in a dense city like Satogenbosch, with over 1,200 listed monuments, it's very difficult uh, to find a place for a space-consuming sewage tank. And the next slide, please. In Sotogenbosch, we were lucky to have a Maria Bastion, a former stronghold to the fortress, demolished in the late 19th century. The need for the sewage reservoir gave the inspiration to restore this bastion. Archaeological research revealed the foundations of the former stronghold and also determined the maximum length of the basin. Next slide, please. A public park has been created on top of the sewage tank. And this urban park is a lively place embraced by students and residents. Um, I believe now it, I have a short video on the next project. It's uh, St. John's Bulwark. It's an another heritage-led solution to climate change. Maybe you can start the video now. Well, for a century, this stronghold was hidden beneath the pavement and completely invisible to the public. Um, next slide, please. By restoring the bulwark and reintegrating it into the urban grid, the original function of this spot as a gateway to the town has been restored as well. The bulwark has become a social hub where information is exchanged, 
It's a central meeting point for both locals and foreigners alike. Next slide, please. A strict precondition for this design was the water defense function. A demountable weir has been constructed. It can be erected to protect the bulwark and its precious heritage against flooding, as you can see on this photo taken in March this year. Um, my last slide uh, shows the uh, rooftop park. So next slide, please. Uh, the rooftop park is uh, small. It's only 600 square meters, but suitable for intensive use with ample seating. And it's wonderfully situated, giving a wide view to both sides of over the length of the river. A permeable gravel carpet between the tiles retains rainwater for the trees. So, as I explained in my introduction, the people of Satogobos once used water as ally. Today, we face the challenge to deal with ever-changing quantities of water, be it the rising water level of our rivers or the sudden heavy rain showers. And let's not forget drought and heat during summer. We will have to find new solutions to the threats we face on local, regional, national, and even on, an, on a larger scale. And I'm convinced that understanding heritage provides inspiring and smart solutions to climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Krens, for sharing your experience in the city of Den Bosch. And we will now move to our third speaker, Mrs. Salim Verhoeven. Mrs. Uh, uh, Salim Verhoeven is a landscape architect, program manager, and lecturer with a vast experience in urban design and landscape transformation. She represents Landschap Noord Holland, an NGO for nature development, and one of the leading partners of the Amsterdam Wetlands Project. Amsterdam Wetlands is an exciting new initiative with the aim to transform and connect more than 12,000 hectares of farmland and natural areas north of the city of Amsterdam, with close attention to the use of traditional practices and historical land management knowledge. Allow me to give you a warm welcome, Mrs. Verhoeven, and please do take the floor. Thank yeah, thank you, uh, Corinne Hoffman. Um, I would like to start uh, uh, this presentation with a, a short vi uh, video uh, that will introduce the project and also the area that we are focusing on. Please start the video. Amsterdam wetlands are peatlands between Amsterdam and Alkmaar where four nature preservation and recreation agencies have joined forces to realize 12,000 acres of connected nature reserves, an unforgettable experience of the natural areas and to contribute to future-proof agriculture. <music> Historical pastures, old villages, and traces of former dike breaches along the Zuiderzee. Together, they tell the story of the reclamation of this low moor landscape north of Amsterdam, an icon of the typically Dutch landscape. The openness, the lush meadows and marshes, the historical landscape, the variety of land use and entrepreneurship on peat boulders and on reclaimed land offers an unprecedented quality on a national and international level. The area has culturally, historically valuable elements, such as the Beemster Polder and the fence line of Amsterdam, both UNESCO World Heritage Sites. There are several nature reserves with European protection. This valuable landscape is located in the middle of the highly urbanized area of the metropolitan region of Amsterdam and Alkmaar, where the number of inhabitants and visitors will continue to grow considerably in the coming years. Yes, thank you for showing this uh, video. I'm really happy to uh, present uh, uh, to you our project Amsterdam Weapons at this uh, uh, Road to uh, Climate Adaptation uh, uh, Summit. And I'll do this on behalf of uh, 
uh, Staatsbosbeheer, Natuurmonumenten, Recreatie Noord-Holland en Landschap Noord-Holland. All agencies for uh, nature uh, preservation and uh, recreation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if we look at the area north of uh, Amsterdam, uh, it's actually uh, entrepreneurship, technical innovation, uh, uh, and a high level of, of, of art and, and architecture that, that actually created this, uh, this landscape. It created beautiful and unique landscapes, uh, which we still enjoy and, and cherish uh, today. Uh, landscapes like the Beemster, for instance, that was uh, cultivated and, and drained water uh, uh, to develop new uh, agriculture land, uh, to create space for uh, uh, country estates, uh, and also to find uh, the water loaf that, that was taking up more and more uh, a land of the, the peats. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the landscape was developed in such a way uh, that it could feed the fast-growing city of Amsterdam. Uh, and, and this slide shows the organization of uh, uh, that landscape, okay, with the, the, the milk being produced closer to the city, cheese and butter uh, a little bit further away, and the bulk uh, grains and, and cereals uh, uh, even further away. And also the defense line of uh, Amsterdam was created in such a, a manner uh, that it could feed the inhabitants within uh, for a couple of months. Uh, therefore, there was also this grain silo in uh, the middle of the city. And next slide, please. But, but the, the technical uh, innovation also came with a downside, uh, especially after the uh, Second World War and, and maybe the 70s, uh, when uh, uh, the lowering of the water levels uh, uh, in order to uh, accommodate uh, agriculture on these uh, peatlands uh, caused uh, problems with uh, soil subsidence, uh, the peat being evaporated and, and, and uh, releasing CO2 uh, into the air, uh, and also uh, the lowering of the biodiversity in the uh, uh, landscape. Um, climate adaptation means uh, in this landscape that, that we have to higher uh, the, the groundwater levels uh, and uh, uh, enhance uh, biodiversity uh, with that. Uh, and, uh, store uh, and then uh, uh, keep uh, the, the peat. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, but how? Um, and I think that is uh, what we can learn from the history of this, this region. Uh, this, is, this is the Krat. Uh, it's it's a, a food box uh, scheme uh, that, that delivers locally produced uh, food um, uh, to my home uh, uh, all year around. Uh, it's, it's all from the region of, uh, of Amsterdam. And I think if we look at the future of this, this region you're talking about, uh, we can join forces uh, again to recreate an attractive, um, uh, uh, climate adaptive uh, uh, landscape and, and shortening uh, the food supply chain with a more focus on uh, the, the, the region uh, and connect urban and rural uh, again could be a way to restore the peatlands. Next slide, please. Like, for example, uh, using uh, the, the, the infrastructure that is still uh, there, uh, former uh, shipping routes that were uh, meant to uh, ship uh, uh, the milk to the, the city do have a great potential uh, for recreation and also for the distribution of the food that is being produced in the uh, villages. Uh, um, because the villages are uh, still all um, uh, directly linked to the city through the waterways in which historically the, the, the milk was being sailed uh, to the uh, city. Um, that is something that we could use again. Um, next slide, please. What we think in our project and the way we, we work on it is, is that the landscape is a physical reflection of uh, our culture. Uh, 
the landscape, what you buy, what you eat, what you uh, uh, choose is what is reflect, uh, uh, reflected in, in the landscape. Uh, and we believe that our collective heritage can help us in the challenge of climate adaptation, uh, restoring the peatlands, uh, store CO2 again, and enhance biodiversity. With like the picture that I showed before, uh, the Willem, uh, painting of Willemaris shows uh, high wa groundwater levels, flowering grass fields, uh, meadow birds, and cows uh, with reed beds uh, that, that stitch nature areas uh, together uh, with production that is in balance with the soil and the nature. Thank you. This was my presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Verhoeven, for your inspiring presentation of the Amsterdam Wetlands Project. I would now like to introduce our last speaker, Mr. Boy Antoine, joining us from a different part of our kingdom, the island of Bonaire in the Caribbean. Okay, good morning. Or good afternoon. Mr. Antoine, Mr. Antoine is a journalist, writer, and founder and director of the Fouy Kubo Foundation on Bonaire. He has written about the history, culture, heritage, and nature of Bonaire since the 1970s. The foundation is close to finalizing a documentary on Bonaire using local oral history. By interviewing residents of the island, valuable information about the history and culture of Bonaire can be stored. Every person that passes is an archive lost. This also implies too much needed local traditional knowledge on climate adaptation. We are delighted with your presence today, Mr. Antoine, and may I invite you to take the floor. Okay, good, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm working with Fui Kubo, that is uh, the historical uh, cultural foundation of Bonaire. Uh, Fuikubo dedicates itself to the to document the oral history of Bonaire. We have done over 2,000 interviews, uh, not only on Bonaire, but also in Curaçao, Aruba, uh, Seba, uh, and uh, Stasia. Uh, two years ago, we had a large project with volunteers and with the UNESCO to document uh, the elders of Bonaire, the people of Bonaire in key positions uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, natural disasters. Uh, the times which we, that affected us uh, historically, uh, going back to the 1800s till present time, uh, also climate changes, uh, mitigation, res uh, resiliency, and uh, adaptation. We documented over uh, 35 persons, including farmers, fishermen, and officials, like the harbor master of Bonaire, the airport manager, the Gesagheber of Bonaire, the lieutenant governor of the, sign of the island. What uh, has gotten more attention is how climate change is affecting our environment. Uh, the last uh, decades, less rain, uh, the rain that does fall goes to the sea due to lack of a good system to capture and contain excess of water. We use also archives, uh, old maps of Bonaire, old uh, uh, pictures of the island, but especially interviews with uh, the elderly people of the island. We will show a short uh, video a trailer of the documentary that we had uh, made uh, two years ago. Video, please. Global warming. Todo el camino está viendo más caliente. Nos aíslan la nord, la nord pole, que se ve por el Holanda, nosso ambiente, nosso vai ter a frio, se mandar passar, estava mais caliente que o Bonaire. 
dia di 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 lani di nan no bunda pora pasa di di subi karpata ba po bai bo pa e la manta subi di baranga pasa den ga min basa no di ko me nan me se bin un plan di awa ante e plan di awa to bai en saka ko bai support ga e area nan um ku te importante pa nos collecta ai awa se porta e ai di dam no tra caschi pe che no fa cavole e roina e roina me se queda limpi me se queda mantene e awa no me se bai ding direction di la man e awa me se bai den direction di bo water bleit bo plan pa bai den dam nan me se cos e construction di kaya nan o bo te trabo kaya nan me se tene cuenta ku e awa ku te kai no me se queda riba kaya me se bai den un roi ante e roi ten un destinacion al final ayuda nos como bonero para de futuro planta back y también para mantener nos naturaleza dam a carga más agua dam es un gran en la cena y me dam dam gran hombres es es siempre que no quiero atraer antes en el tanque con chiquito no se me van a enfadar también una salida dispo para cuando un tique agua pero el dam es un como ese es un estipula para que más agua den con nunca. No estamos en la que el roi no se stop. De manera, plug está bien, voluntario. Pero si no hay nada, te pagan, pero no sabe el valor de agua que va a perder. Agua es parte más esencial para que uno quiera de comer. Es bien si me está agua, es galinha me está agua, es cabrito me está agua, es porco me está agua. Yo tengo que dar simplemente a dispersar. A tempo da uma para trás, tanto que matrimônio, a virou aqui um plano de parcelação, e da uma boana, pouco a pouco, mas também é com a gente para casa, e vai aí um momento quando o tempo da uma, e botar aí porque a água, não é a água que vai, e essa aí se corta, está causa, está segurado, porque também causa inconveniência, problema, inundando o lugar. Hospital, mas tem um grupo de hospital. Os pessoas não um dia, diferente dia, a sua subida última, aí não, com hora de chover forte, tem problema no hospital. Mais duro um coisa lá, mais lida, da quebra, da que palimente, casi barra e por isso tem blur aqui com muita da Ainda 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 vibra, pero um 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 lugar atrás de betão. E se tá senti e e e e escuro um be da caiu de bom matar o homem. Nós grande nessa bisa é casa de barra da maneira boa. É da hala rosia. Então ora é tempo bem e é bem tudo duro. Um coisa mais dura está mais é bem da trago né mas é casa de barra não vai. Bimbek, bai, bimbek. Entah, ekasi bara buta buta orketa mana ini buta buta mide de. Orketa, 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 orketa. Entah, orketa depende kong kita kita mai bukit. Pesis 50 cm, ibira 1 meter. Entah buta itu kruse bara. Nanti buta niung kabuya, niung klabu nekose. Saya hari ke improve tu masih difisi pada determina ke momento kita pas obat nasi kong saya hari ke lobini. Que categoria ele quer lutar? Não só os aqui na maioria parte dos outros que em dois, maioria parte de enviar três, pelo maioria parte de casa que não está agora para passar para o sistema número dois, não está por banda o que de trabalho foi escrito no novo, então bem isso é para pôr mais exigência de qualidade de trabalho. O problema está com o consumidor quando está dando mais a bai perdi, quizás no bai perdi, pero no te voy a usar más o no han derecho un dam. Es un dam de un fichi, un consumiento para cómo te trae dam. Lo mejor que pide es atención para pagar ti no que me te doy bien o no a llegar de usar. No me se quiere a mí averiguar todo de diferente en el botón junto y me lo cual pues no te hace algo más o más esencial documentar. Again, thank you so much for these insightful presentations. So we will now start with a panel discussion. And in this discussion, we will elaborate further on the cases that were just presented. 
So I would like to emphasize to all those at home that you can raise questions to our speakers via the chat function connected to this webcast. So my first question would go to Mr. Antoine. So please can you tell us what is uh, the human aspect of the, the climate, the nature problem in your area? Yeah, uh, like we saw in the in the video, the water is going to the sea. The people are not working uh, in the farms anymore. They went to work in the tourism sector. The maintenance of dams and small water reservoirs, like uh, we we call them tankies, have been neglected. Bonaire has since 1963 a water plant, uh, a desalination uh, plant. And they don't use the water. They don't use. Uh, they don't catch the water in cisterns uh, like in the past. That is uh, one of our problems here in Bonaire. And I heard uh, somebody said about uh, uh, Holland. Uh, they know how to deal with with water. So uh, we expect that they can help us <laughs> on this. Yes. Sure. Anybody else want to elaborate on this question? No? Then I have another question for you. So what made um, heritage cultural history useful in your approach uh, to climate adaptation? Um, yeah, our elders teach us uh, how to deal with uh, uh, rainwater. Uh, their goal is to uh, avoid to go into the sea. And if the water go into the sea, we had a problem with the, with the coral reefs uh, around the island. I think we can uh, learn of the old people of, of Bonaire. They have a lot of uh, knowledge. Uh, we are trying to 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 yeah to catch the knowledge uh, knowledge of the older people to yeah for the people now so they can use it to to deal with the water. Yeah, it's very interesting. Mr. Keynes, can you tell us how it is in your region? Yes, uh, I, uh, if I can add into to Boyd's uh, learning from the past solutions brought us, um, let's say, better embedded solutions. Uh, learning from the past brought us solutions that people are familiar with and, and that provided support to, to our uh, projects. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Marika, I have a question for you. So what inspired you to take the approach you took? And what circumstances enabled you to think from a heritage perspective? Well, actually, that's the big challenges we are facing now. Because before, for heritage, the main threat to heritage was people and their activities of changing and developing listed buildings and landscapes. But now, changes are to be made because of climate adaptation and renewable energy. And um, that's a whole new force, and we don't have any rules for that now yet. Um, so we have to change our attitude um, and to help make rules and policies. Because if you don't help now, you miss an opportunity to have something to say later. And it can really mean also to broaden our work as heritage consultants to use our knowledge for a different purpose than to preserve heritage. You can use it for renewable energy. You can, re you can use it for climate climate adaptation. Yes, and so and what forms of knowledge and tools did you use to design your solutions? Because you talked about maps, but um, you yeah. didn't do any archaeological uh, work. Yes, we had. Uh, uh, there were uh, archaeological research made already, and we used that. And we uh, used op uh, design research to do that. So we, we so we we combined every the knowledge we had from the landscape architects, from arch uh, archaeologists, from the local experiences, and from the sewers and the hydrologists, and uh, that combined together with uh, research design, um, and we integrated that in a process. Um, so for the process, it's very important that you don't start to make solutions and design solutions. First, you do all your research with every expert available to you and uh, sharing your expertise. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Kreins, can you elaborate on that? Um, 
Well, there are a lot of similarities <laughs> in our uh, approaches. And in, in our case, the, the design team um, um, represented many fields of expertise. So history was not regarded as a, as a burden, but historians, archaeologists, uh, they were full members of the design team. And um, I think that's 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 one of one uh, a key element to 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 um, um, to to to, yeah, to make better projects. Um, um, the, the the excavations are, were carried out like in comp prior to the uh, to, prior, prior to the designing phase, and and uh, historians provide relevant. Uh, resources uh, like maps or other information that, um, uh, let's say, from the town archives, the designers um, could use as an inspiration. So um, it's really the other way around. Uh, uh, the uh, design of a, of a solution to climate change is not like a UFO landing in your town or in, in your region, but um, it, it starts with um, um, investigating in your archives, investigated in, in your soil by archaeologists, and 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 also uh, from the um, um, Bonaire example, um, uh, talking to uh, elderly or people who have some experience about how 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 things happened in the past. Yes, yes, because I was wondering, uh, Mr. Antoine. Uh, you used uh, principally uh, oral history, but but uh, you use also other types of um, of archives and or other tools of knowledge. Yes, yes, uh, we use uh, maps, old maps. We have a Verbata map of Bonaire that is uh, from 1907, and the cadaster on Bonaire is also some topographic uh, maps that we use, but uh, uh, also old uh, studies that were done on this uh, topic on, on 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 the dams of Bonaire on the wells of Bonaire too and and old uh, pictures like I said and and what were then the main challenges in, in the realization of your plans the main challenges to uh, to convince the people how important is it is to maintain uh, the, the water on lands, uh, especially uh, uh, politicians, because they have to deal with uh, the, with the people that uh, that want development of the island. They want money, work. Mm -hmm. That is a challenge for me. For Do me. you recognize to, that to, to convince the people? Yes. Yes. Sure. Do you recognize that, uh, Mr. Krenz? Yes, our starting point was quite similar. Um, uh, no funding and no support. And um, so that, that was quite difficult. And we didn't start with a plan. We didn't start with a, a, a fancy um, a, a project. But we started with raising awareness to the citizens, to the, to the people, to the locals, who were not aware that the town uh, is a wall town. If you would ask a citizen, um, could you mention a wall town? They would say Naarden or, or Heusden or another wall town in the Netherlands, but not the town they live in. So we first had to work on that, uh, that, that there was awareness that, they, that, that people live in a wall town and what walls actually um, mean. So they, this, this function of water bearing function, that was what people were not aware of. So. Um, and we, 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 we had to investigate in, in, in local support. Um, and we did that not by um, uh, raising awareness to the, let's say, usual suspects of people who are interested already in heritage, but for instance, in families with young children or people who are interested in, in, in outdoor sports activities. So that, that, was, that helped us a lot to get uh, a, a very, well, a large support from the municipality, from the community, to our, um, let's say, costly and, and, and um, um, restoration and, and development uh, uh, project. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Verhoeven, I'm curious to know how uh, did you include citizens in your project and what were the challenges? 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, since since we we work on such a large uh, area, uh, it, it it is uh, difficult to reach uh, uh, citizens. Uh, uh, the, the, in the beginning, uh, what we did is we mainly uh, informed uh, citizens about what we are doing uh, and, and and asked for their feedback. But uh, now, as we're entering uh, a new phase, uh, we are start to realize projects, uh, uh, helped with uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, and, and funding uh, uh, from the province, from uh, uh, the, the government, and from uh, also Air Food Deal. Um, now we can actually start forming communities around the projects that we're uh, uh, that we're doing uh, and 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 then, then you can see that that uh, using the the, the local uh, experience and that, that I really liked in in the uh, in the part of the documentary uh, of Bonaire uh, this really precise information about uh, the area and and the experience from generations uh, uh, yeah that is something that we can really use uh, taking the projects uh, to uh, the next level. Yeah, may maybe you can explain a bit more about that, uh, Mr. Antoine, about involving the, the, um, the citizens in, in your research. Okay. Um, I, I must say all the programs, uh, all the interviews that we make with all people, or with the people of Bonaire, we put them on uh, our own channel uh, of television here on Bonaire. Um, and uh, uh, doing that, you get response for, from more people. Uh, and we have a radio program too, every every week uh, on Vosti Bonero, and uh, the people can react, can tell their, their experience about uh, yeah everything of the past. You have, I think, you have to go to evolve to evolve the people but uh, use uh, the media, radio, yeah, because... television, and newspaper. I'm lucky because I have I uh, have a newspaper here on Bonaire, I have a television station, and I work with the radio, so I can uh, reach the people very easily. And how are the younger people reacting uh, towards this? I don't know, because... Uh, <laughs> I'm not working with the schools. Uh, some uh, uh, someone else have to do this. I'm trying yeah. via, via uh, OCW to to get uh, to go to the schools with its uh, information. I don't know how the younger people uh, react. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it, it looks like like very important because of course if you talk about oral tradition, you talk about uh, the the elderly. Uh, this is probably um, dying out at a certain moment. Are you not afraid yeah. of that? Yeah. But we have a, a challenge that is to, yeah, uh, every interview we have in a, in a, in a NAS system. So we have the, all the information, uh, as, yeah, somebody has to, to use them. Thank you. Um, Marike van Sante, what makes climate adaptation difficult for municipalities or other organizations? Well, um, the challenges were um, to link the different interests together from inhabitants, from entrepreneurs, from um, uh, visitors and climate adaptation. So it was very difficult. You have a lot of functions in a very small area, so you have to uh, double the functions, multiple functions on the same time. So that was um, that was really uh, a challenge. And the other one was there were already agreements on the amount of parking spaces, of what measures could not be taken, um, because the inhabitants very objected to open water in the area. Uh, but the research of the cultural history showed that there was always open water in that area until the day that they built houses there. So it was uh, part of the solution and became very uh, logical to make that solution. So that was a challenge that was, um, that was good for heritage. So they became aware of it. Yes, I was wondering also, uh, Saline, for example, in your study, 
Uh, is the current need for cladio ad adaptation uh, only something of the present, or is it something that cultures and communities have been doing already for centuries? And uh, how are you learning from that? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the area we're working on is an example of this uh, 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 Dutch tradition to to live with uh, with uh, uh, the water, and uh, so people are used to dealing uh, with uh, climate change uh, uh, for a very long time. Eh? The marshes were uh, cultivated uh, uh, for for growing uh, uh, our food. Uh, the, the 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 lakes were being. Uh, 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 yeah, transformed into into polderlands and and actually also the the influence of the sea in this in this area, uh, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, completely disappeared when we closed off uh, the Zuider Zee. So 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 people are used of uh, yeah that they have to deal with uh, the climate uh, uh, change in this region. But I think. Uh, uh, that that um, we now depend too much on uh, on the government, and we are not aware uh, anymore uh, on on the effect uh, on our lives and the effect of our own uh, uh, actions. Uh, so I think uh, that is something that we can uh, uh, learn uh, from from history, and also what I think. Uh, 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 that was referring to the, the local communities that, that we can form now around uh, the project. Uh, you see that, that because the people have been here in the region uh, for uh, many uh, generations, uh, especially the farmers, most of it is family uh, uh, businesses, and they have been in the area a lot, so they have, have seen it change. Uh, and we can learn uh, uh, from that. So we can learn from uh, the change that they uh, experienced. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Keynes, can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, as I showed in my presentation, um, our citizens used water as an ally and, and learned to, to, uh, to live with rising water level. Um, so at, but at, at times, of 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 um, when a town was under siege, then then um, uh, let's say um, um, when when the town was un, un, uh, was under siege, then it, uh, the town walls were closed, the gates were closed, and the town and the community had to function as an as a as a as a, um, a self-supporting entity, as an autarky, and, and people were depending on each other. So. Um, uh, I, I think that's what we can learn from an historic town. How did a town function in the past, not only from the, um, uh, let's say, the more physical um, uh, part, like, of, 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 um, uh, um, but also from the, from, from the social aspect. How did a town uh, function at, the, at, at those difficult times? Um, and, and I think we should not fight the climate, but regard it as our ally. Uh, we have to 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 change um, um, yeah we have uh, we have to change in order uh, for the climate to change we have uh, so the people have to change not the climate has ha has to change and I think that's what we could we can learn from how we dealt with climate change in the past yes. Yeah, so maybe we um, just go over to uh, the public and see if there are some uh, questions coming in. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Hofman. Uh, my name is Marcus van Tor. I'm a project officer at uh, the Netherlands Commission for uh, UNESCO. And we have been taking note of all the questions and comments um, in, the, in the comment section. Thank you very much for all the input. We really appreciate that. Um, we have made a selection of four short questions, uh, which I will read. The first one is to uh, Mrs. Van Zanten. How did the Foundation Oversticht come up with the idea of Waterkanser project and to make use of heritage and historical knowledge? The second oh. question is, to what extent has the Rijksdienst voor Cultureel Erfgoed, the um, Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency, been involved in the project in Kampen and Dumbles? 
then a question to, uh, for Mr. Mr. Kreins. Were similar research techniques like studying old maps used in uh, them both and we, in what ways uh, the similar techniques uh, to uh, the case in Kampen? Uh, and lastly, a question to Mr. Antoine. Um, is the dam system as applied on Bonaire also used in other places in the region and in the world? Back to you, Corinna Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, let's start with the, the first uh, question then to, um, to um, Mrs. Van Zanten. So how did the foundation Oversteer come up with the idea of water council project and to make use of historical uh, knowledge? Um, I think it's, uh, it became uh, very clear that something had to happen with our heritage because we have so much uh, other problems facing uh, uh, climate change and uh, renewable energy. So we are always looking for new solutions and looking uh, differently at heritage. So it's my job to look diff with different eyes to heritage and where can we uh, use heritage in other social challenges. So this was one and the climate adaptation was very quick one because we are so, um, we have uh, climate adaptation in our DNA and just we forgot a short while because of the bigger and longer uh, dikes. So it was very naturally. And when we came up with the idea, we talked to other people, uh, by the RCA also, eh? uh, the government, and they sharpened our research questions. So that was very good. We talked to the water authorities. Uh, that was very good. So together we uh, we made these um, research questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kreins. Were similar research techniques like studying old maps uh, used in the both case, like those used in Compa project to uncover the underground and the past? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, as as you can see in the background of Miss Van Zante, the, the beautiful historic map. We have similar maps, and um, we, as I also told, we we start investigated, investigate, investigating those maps from the, the real old one to the current one from the cadaster. So. There's, and, and you can put those maps on top of each other, and you can uh, and, and and you can also then see how um, how a town or how a region changed over the over the eras, so over the years. So uh, yes, certainly we use those maps, uh, um, uh, and also combining those maps with archaeological research and also research in, into buildings. So it's, yes. um, it's a real uh, holistic a holistic approach. Then a question to, to both of you, um, that was the Rijksdienst for the Cultural Erfgoed, the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency, involved in your projects? Marieke. Yes, they were very important. Um, first of all, we, we uh, developed these new sorts of projects and it's hard to get them through and get them uh, paid for to get budget for it and to get right partners. And they, for us, are right partner and they have sometimes um, financed our projects. So we are very happy with them. And uh, at least of all, they contribute their knowledge to us. So that was very important. So they are a very important partner for us. Mr. Keynes, well, similar, to answer. Our, similar to us at the at the start of our project 20 years ago, the uh, the, the, uh, the the agency start, uh, also launched the Belvedere Memorandum, and that says, uh, well, in short, preservation by development. So that helped us a lot, not uh, to come with a mere conservation plan, but with a development plan to our uh, fortress. And they even uh, agreed to uh, to the demolishment of the monument, that was really, really unique. Uh, at some place, we had to make a connection between the canals underneath our water, our town, the Binnendiese Canal, and to the moat that surrounds uh, 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 around the fortress or around the wall town. And they agreed to the, this demolishment of the monument while opening up this uh, this. Um, this part between um, uh, the river and um, and making a, a, a boat trip uh, possible, so we were very happy with this uh, with the cooperation of the uh, of the national agency, and they also provided us with some 
part of the budget, so with some some funding to the to the restoration and and the development of the fortress. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, then the last question was for Mr. Antoine. Uh, is the dam system as applied on Bonaire also used in other places in the region or in the world? Do you know about that? Uh, in the world, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Curacao and Aruba uh, and uh, Venezuela, the uh, Guajira uh, region that is in uh, both Venezuela and Colombia, I was there, I saw the, the system, but especially on Aruba, Aruba, there are some uh, villages that has names of of the, uh, of uh, them or Tanki, uh, what to call them, like Tanki Flip in Aruba, Tanki Landed. They are villages in Aruba. That uh, that means that the, the dams and the, 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 the Tankis were very important for the island, and the the gullies, we call them uh, Roy, like in in Dutch. Roy Hundu, Roy Fontaine, Roy Floyd. So especially in Aruba, they are still uh, maintaining the, the dams and tankies. I don't know the the name of tanki <laughs> in, the, in English. It's like uh, water is water, yeah, but yes, uh, yes. naturally, not, they, they, don't, they didn't build it, okay? Well, those were the questions from the public, and I think I have one more question that I want to uh, to ask you, and it's about um, about policies. How can heritage strictly be included into climate adaptation strategies? Maybe Salim, you can answer this. Um. Yeah, it, 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 it is a, a difficult uh, question. It's not the easiest one. But I, I think as, as, um, for, for uh, our project, at least, uh, it, it depend, it's, it's, uh, how we are talking about landscape uh, uh, as a physical reflection of our culture. And um, so it, 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 you see that, that it, it's regional, it's provincial uh, governments that are, uh, 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 yeah, that, that, that have to take control over this. Uh, and I think cultural uh, uh, heritage and, and the awareness that the landscape is a reflection of our uh, uh, culture um, um, could help um, to engage uh, the people uh, within this this enormous uh, uh, operation and, and project, uh, because if we talk about the the, the climate adaptation uh, and and, and nat nature uh, uh, biodiversity uh, uh, development uh, and restoration in in this area, uh, we also talk about conflicting interests, uh, like uh, Marika also uh, uh, said, uh, and. Um, Engaging people uh, through the, our common history, I think, uh, could be a way uh, to do this. Yes. Somebody else wants to elaborate on that? Marika? Maybe? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think education is uh, very important on, on every level, uh, starting from elementary school to uh, later on, and in management and water heritage uh, and water studies and heritage studies. But it also, um, you need to engage the community and you have, therefore, you have to make it fun. Uh, it has to be something you, you can live and you can experience. And uh, in Kampen, there is a very special way to do that. And they have a high water brigade, and it's hundreds of volunteers who are helping the water authorities. And they have annual exercises to uh, protect the old town from flooding. It, 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 it happens every now and then, so we're exercising every year. And so the streets are shut down, and the windows and the, the doors from the um, uh, houses are shut down with certain beams and shutters. And um, and there are sandbags everywhere. It's like a military operation. It's very beautiful to do that uh, and to see it once. And it's a lot of fun. And everybody gets a bit of bala and soup. So everybody's happy. And so, and, and uh, with that happiness, they, people come aware of their of the water and the water systems, and they learn a lot by it. That's good, I think. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, Boy, do you want to um, add something to this? Yes, I think that uh, there must be a fund, money, 
to help the people to maintain uh, the dams because not all the dams of Bonaire are on the public uh, uh, grounds. They are in uh, in farms of the people of Bonaire and sometimes they don't have the money to restore and to maintain the dams. I think they ask to do that as, uh, in the policy. And uh, the giving of a permit to build houses, it, uh, yeah. You have to see that they don't go into build in, in in areas where are dams or the the tank the tankies. I think that's has to be in a, in a policy. And what is the relationship with with the policymakers? My relationship. Well, the relationship uh, of policymakers towards climate change adaptation. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult question. Yeah, I, uh, I can ask, uh, ask that. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a, a, like like uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So, um, is there any remarks that you would like to make, one of the four of you, before closing, or you have said everything that is to say? <laughs> That is to be said. Uh, of course not, but uh, I think that will take a lot more time. Yeah. Okay, so then we are um, coming to um, to an end of this event, and uh, I. Uh, what I took from the discussion are the following points and observations. So. Um, first of all, culture and climate adaptation are indispensably connected to each other, as are um, interactions between human and, and the environment. Uh, so culture adaptation and nature adaptation should go hand in hand. A heritage discussion should go beyond mere heritage protection, but should also focus on how heritage can contribute to resolve societally relevant questions, such as in the case of adaptation to, to climate challenges and in strengthening cultural identity and a sense of belonging. Then key is bringing together different stakeholders as we have seen, GEOs, NGOs, researchers and societal partners to combine technical, scientific, traditional knowledge and contemporary knowledge practices into the design, the planning and policy making and to co-create sustainable and inclusive strategies for climate adaptation. I think also that culture uh, should not be seen as an investment uh, or, um, but, but uh, in, it should be seen as an investment and not as a cost or a burner, burden for, for governments or policymakers. And finally, I think it is crucial to create public awareness and a sense of ownership through the process of co-creation, education, and community participation and engagement. So as a final note, I would like to say that it was a tremendous pleasure speaking to the four of you and learning more about these important projects and initiatives. I would also like to thank all of you who have logged in and attended this online event, and a special, special thanks to all the questions that were raised by the public. There may be questions that remain unanswered due to the time limitations, and there sure are, but we will do our best to pay attention to those questions in the report of this event that will be published afterwards on the, on the website of unesco.nl. So before I give the floor back to the Secretary General, Marie-Lise Schelhaas, for the closing words, just a few more practical remarks. So the recordings of this event will be available in about a week on the Road Tokas YouTube channel, so that you and others have access to the event at a later stage as well. If you would like to stay informed about the upcoming activities of our commission or the intertwining of heritage, culture, and climate adaptation, please visit our website, www.unesco.nl, or follow us on social media. You may also send us an email to info at unesco.nl. 
So having said this, it is an honor to give the floor to Mrs. Schelhaas, who will conclude this event with an official statement. Professor Hoffman, thank you very much for uh, moderating this very inspiring discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, today we have seen a number of examples in which culture and heritage are key ingredients for local climate response. I would like uh, to sincerely thank the speakers for sharing their insights and experiences. Your cases have not only inspired us, they have also given us a deeper understanding of the power of heritage and culture to offer solutions to climate adaptations that are tailor-made to local contact, context and needs. We can draw a number of conclusions from our discussion today that will help us shape a vision about the essential need for heritage and culture in climate adaptation policy and practices. First, we need to move away from the dualistic worldview where nature and culture are too often considered as two separate domains. The examples, uh, examples of today show us the continuous intertwining of culture and nature in human environments. As such, nature-based and culture-based solutions to climate adaptations go hand in hand. Second, humans' response to climate change, such as the fight against water or drought, is not just something of the present. It is something that communities have been doing for centuries. We need these forms of knowledge, besides scientific or technical knowledge, to adequately tackle climate adaptations. Knowledge based on experience or practical skills, on trial and error. Knowledge that is acquired by responding to a constantly changing natural and human environment. Knowledge that is stored in our traditions, our history, our local practices, our heritage. Third, today's examples have demonstrated that when, that when action is built on local traditions and customs, it provides agency to community groups to be in the driver's seat of change. The use of culture in climate adaptations enhances community participation and, as such, helps democratize climate action and enhances communities' resilience to external factors. Four, and last, when climate adaptation is built on heritage, culture and traditions, communities will be more likely to support policy decisions and government plans for climate action. Building on the identity of communities is a necessary ingredient for their acceptance and therefore for successful implementation of policy measures. In conclusion, the Netherlands Commission for UNESCO calls for a greater recognition of the power of culture, heritage and traditional knowledge in climate action. We need yesterday's experience to design today's and tomorrow's climate solutions, in which the human factor is key. Therefore, let us see, our, uh, let us see our event today not as the end of our journey, rather as a beginning. We are on the road to CAS, the International Climate Adaptation Summit taking place in January 2021. We will continue our journey also after the summit, to take a stand for culture and heritage in climate policy. We will seek alliances with practitioners, knowledge partners and policymakers to sharpen our vision and to define policy recommendations. We will continue to collect and share best practices. As such, we will contribute towards a growing movement of the much needed acceptance, action and human agency to, indeed, change minds, not the climate. With this statement, we've come to the end of this event. On behalf of the Netherlands Commission for UNESCO and the organizing partners, I would like to thank the Minister and the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management, and naturally the technical staff and all colleagues, especially Koosje, Marike and Marcus, for making this event possible. For all of you around the world, I wish you a pleasant afternoon, a good evening, or a very good morning. Goodbye. <laughs>